Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1971 Italian giallo film Short Night of Glass Dolls. And this is not like the other giallo films that I've been reviewing or that most people end up seeing because unlike most giallo films, this kind of has a point to it. Some people call this like the most political giallo film. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's so much political as it's just it's making a social commentary, which I think is pretty accurate, not just for the 70s, but for always pretty much and applies to pretty much every country, in my opinion. But I'll end up talking a little bit more about that as I go along with the review. Now, this one doesn't have a whole lot of backstory information on it that I was able to find when I was doing my research. Uh, pretty bare bones with that stuff. It's not done by, done by anyone who's like a big name or anything like that. Uh, but first, before I get into things, just so you know, if you're into Giallo, I have an entire playlist on my channel of Giallo film reviews, so go ahead and check that out. When I'm uh, doing this review, I have about 16. This will be like my 17th uh, Giallo film review, but I'm going to keep going, so just know that. Anyway, Short Night of Glass Dolls was written and directed by Aldo Lotto, who did other films such as Who Saw Her Die?, the Humanoid, Circle of Fear, and Dark Friday. Reviews for this, the only bit of information I have is that reviews for this film were very mixed. You had some people coming out saying, this is a brilliant film, this is great. And you had some people coming out saying, it's kind of aimless, pointless, and, and slow. Now, going into it because I knew about these mixed reviews situation, I was very hesitant to be hopeful about the film for myself. I was thinking, here we go, this might really suck. But actually, uh, after some issues up front with the film, it really picks up speed towards the end, and especially the end, I think, has great impact, in my opinion. And I ended up really enjoying this. I was not happy with it, maybe about, for the first 30 minutes or so, because it does have pacing problems, for sure. It is kind of slow, uh, yeah, it's not a perfect film by any standards, but once you hit kind of the halfway point or so, it starts getting a lot better, the pace is really picking up, it's more interesting, and the end, the end is the big payoff, and that's the thing, like, with Giallo films, it pretty much is all about the end, and then how it changes the context for a second viewing of that film, and I think this does a great job with that, um, and I do want to watch it again, I recommend this to anyone, so obviously there's spoilers for this, just so you know. Uh, the lack of music in the very beginning of this film makes the discovery of the body, which is Gregory Moore, uh, that's the character, Gregory Moore, um, by that, I guess the guy who's kind of like cleaning up the grounds, uh, groundskeeper guy. So the lack of music there, I think it makes it a bit more disturbing when the body's found. So once again, one of those moments, which like I like to talk about, where film is not, or sorry, film, music is not used and it's not used to great effect, basically. It allows people to just kind of take in what's really happening there without being led by the actual music as to how they should feel, which I think is a wonderful thing. So they did a good job with that. You get a pretty nice tour of the town that they're in or city that they're in when the they're uh, riding along with the ambulance basically that's taking Gregory's body to I guess was it a hospital at first I guess it is a hospital at first I mean you mainly just see him in the morgue first when he actually gets there so um and it's uh it's an interesting thing because kind of the, the tour continues after that as you go through the flashbacks for what Gregory's remembering about how he ended up where he was, and um, it goes many places. Uh, and that's one of the great things about this film, in my opinion, is it's very exploratory, it's got that mystery aspect to it, and it's not just a mystery as in someone staying in one or two locations figuring things out, going to many, many locations. So it shows so much of the architecture, so much of the city, uh, and being a person that's from the United States and has never been outside of, I don't want to say it hasn't been outside of the United States, because I've been to Canada, so technically I have, but other than that, it hasn't been outside of North America, it's cool to see that architecture, and not, and also just because of the time period difference as well, so I like those types of things in film, and it's on full display here, so yeah. What is with the narration with this guy? Uh, before he's pronounced dead, you know, obviously it, it happens very early in the film, one of the things that really threw me off was the narration voiceover by Gregory himself as he's lying there 
people think dead. Um, some people know he's not dead, actually, who are involved. Obviously, we find out at the end. But uh, the narration is not good. It, it was a, not a good choice. They could have come up with it with doing it a different way to show the story. They could have just done a flashback. I just, it's so corny. It's so odd. It's it just, it's weird the way the voiceover goes. And just to have like a, what you assume at that point, dead body talking. I don't like it. I just don't like it for this film. And I think it's perfectly fine for people to hate that about the film. It wasn't a good choice, honestly. And they do it too much. That's the other thing. And another thing on top of that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the flashbacks then where you're getting the narration basically from the point of view of Gregory, not like the, the voiceover parts, but what you're seeing as far as what happened in the past during this film is all from his memory. Like this is him going back through the events in his head and you're following along with the film. So for that reason, it wouldn't be nearly as long and drawn out and boring at times and dragging as it is because people's memories don't work like that. So for that reason, it, it doesn't jive with the story and what's actually going on there. And I think for that reason, they could have easily taken the opportunity to cut the film down a little bit and make it move at a much better pace until they got to the point where they made the film move at a much better pace, basically. So just saying. So the setup for the story is Gregory remembering what happened as he dies, was my question. But no, he's still alive, but he ends up dying, as we find in the end. And I will talk more about that final scene, which I loved. Well, the final scenes, which I really loved. So we'll get there. So apparently this is set in Prague, uh, Czech Republic, during the Cold War. Uh, you can tell by a lot of the architecture and the feel of how characters act toward each other and how the dialogue goes that it is steeped in the cold war at the time not only that but you could tell that it's east of the berlin wall and yeah it just has that feel and it, it creates this whole situation where you could see that the the killer or you know you think it's probably just one killer at first where you can see that the killer may be tied into something like espionage, maybe they're a spy, maybe this is something kind of political going on between countries, or communist versus not. You don't know, because of how heavily they steep this whole film in the Cold War, and, you know, east, or east of the Berlin Wall, it's, um, yeah, it kind of sets up that possibility, honestly. So that kind of throws you a little bit as to what's actually going on, because... I don't know if you were like me, but I was really not expecting the end of this film. It really felt like it came out of left field, but that was a good thing in my opinion. The dialogue continually references the Cold War climate. Obviously, they really hammered it home. The lady Gregory gets introduced to at the party looks like she's in a quasi-zombie state. She's the one that his friend Jack, or I don't know if they're really friends, but at least co-worker Jack, another, another journalist, I guess, was like groping her boobs and was just like, see? And then he's like pointing at her head and being like, it's just like rocks up here. Uh, at first I was like, is this some sort of like drug that he gave her and she's acting like a zombie basically? Or is this just like terribly done? And it ended up just being terribly done because you see her later and she's much different and it's like, there's no explanation as to why she was like that. So that's just another one of those moments in the film where I was like, that was not good and poorly handled. Honestly, the Cold War political setting. Oh, okay, I already said that, that it gives you the idea that M Mira's uh, disappearance may have had to do with something political or espionage related. Uh, the mysteries of Gregory's condition and Mira's disappearance are intriguing with this film early on, but the remembered events are way too drawn out, like I was saying, and since it is Gregory's narration, it should have been a lot more succinct, in my opinion. I mean, this movie is like an hour and 36 minutes, basically. They could have cut this down easily to about an hour and 20, and it would have moved at a better clip. Professor Carding immediately seems suspect as the killer because of his introduction. He ends up not really being the... Well, I was going to say he ends up not really being the killer, but in a way he is actually the killer in the end. The killer of Gregory, because in that final scene, he's the one who puts the scalpel into his heart and actually kills him. So, 
I just that just hit me as I was saying, oh, he wasn't actually the killer. He wasn't the killer of the other of the women. He ended up being the killer of Gregory, though. So I think it's inter interesting when they introduce him because it makes him suspicious because of how he's introduced. Now, that's when he's doing this kind of test on a tomato and it sets up for his character this weird morality that you end up finding out at the end isn't just a weird morality that is for him. It's for everyone kind of of his age, of his generation in that country, or at least in that city. And it's this whole thing where he's showing that tomatoes feel things, that basically plants, just like other living things, feel things. And they basically make some sort of comment of, you know, someone says, so then you're doing a terrible thing when you're cutting a flower. And he says, well, really, in anything you do, there's good and evil in it, basically. And that kind of shows this odd morality where he's, you could see that he thinks that killing women is, or killing anyone really, is actually a bad thing, but also a good thing at the same time. And that ends up being part of, part of the crux of the theme with this which is this particular generation views it as they need to do something terrible to do something good, which basically is keep control of the city, keep control of the political climate, keep control of things in general at the cost of taking the lives and making, taking the lives of the younger generations and making them sacrifice themselves for keeping things the way they have created them. So it's all about control. It's like this cabal of old cultists, basically. There's an interesting idea raised that the old people in power maintain it by sacrificing the youth. That is the main theme, the main theme. Uh, and they make they make that comparison by saying, it's actually a character who says it, by saying that, you know, sending younger people to war to physically die for the country and for these ideologies that are created by older generations and also the silencing of younger people who have ideas for... Uh, changes of policies and the way things should be. Um, and that, like I said, that ends up being basically the whole point of the film, which, like I was saying in the beginning, is not something that Giallo typically does. Giallo is just typically about, let's create this mystery of people getting killed, and in the end, we'll tell you who the killer is. And usually it's some sort of whacked out, individualized motivation for those killings. Um, like a, a killer who has some sort of psychological problem because of some event in their past, or they have some sort of vendetta. Like that's what it usually ends up being. Not this group of an entire generation trying to control a city or an entire country or an entire world and disenfranchise the younger generations just to keep things the way they like it, basically. And a refusal to kind of become progressive, to actually move forward. They want to keep things maintained, keep things preserved, just like they do at Club 99 with the preserved dead insects behind glass, the preserved uh, violins and other instruments that they also have behind glass, and to a degree, the preserved women that have been killed, such as Mira, who you see in a room next to this room with the preserved insects and the preserved instruments behind glass and there she is laying there displayed in the same type of way as those things with these flowers all over her so yet another sacrificing and putting on display to keep it very interesting the old guy whipping <laughs> whipping uh at gregory with the electrical cord i thought was really funny when he goes into club 99 initially his character was just really funny the way they played it and just a, a funny moment. I like that. Uh, it was a good reveal. Uh, like I was talking about Mira's body being next to those preserved things. I thought that was a really good reveal that he was there and he did a little bit of poking around, but he just happened to miss it. And at that point, you really don't know where Mira is or if she's alive or dead. So when they finally show it and he's like, oh, I'm glad he didn't go in there. And then they show her body laying there. That is a big reveal, and it, it, it has impact. It's very interesting. You're like, oh, man, she's dead, and she's at this club. Like, what is going on with this club then? And that becomes the big mystery. It's not, where is Mira? It's, what is this club? Like, that shifts focus, and that ends up being the most important question at that point and until the end. There doesn't really seem to be an explanation of Gregory's love affair with Jessica. That's another thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this film and is one of the bad moments of it, Jessica being the female co-worker he has who 
it, it's obvious he has some sort of a relationship with while he's with Mira. And then when she's gone and he doesn't even know she's dead at that point, that's never fleshed out. There's no backstory to that. It just seems there and it's not necessary. That's obviously one thing that could just be cut out. I'm assuming they probably put it in there so that there's more impact at the end when he gets killed in the, you know, medical theater area and she reacts to it. Like, it'll make more sense that she reacts so strongly, but that's not worth it, in my opinion. Just that scene is great, except, you know, that aspect of it. Uh, there's a quote. I wrote down this quote because I thought it might end up having some sort of uh, significance, but it really didn't have a whole lot. But I also think it was kind of a funny quote. After Gregory and Jessica had sex and they were laying in bed and he's just like kind of zoning out, he says, too many memories, but they don't have anything to do with you. It's kind of cold, honestly. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it didn't have as much significance as I thought it might. Cool shot when Jack takes off the phone or uh, gets off of the phone. When Jack is in the phone booth and he calls Gregory uh, and as soon as he gets off the phone and then all of a sudden the blade of a switchblade pops up on in the frame from the bottom that was an awesome shot that looked really good I love that and then obviously Greg shows up later and he finds blood in that um oh my god phone booth I'm sorry I had a hard time we haven't had phone booths in quite a while so it's kind of hard to pull that one back out but yeah um then he finds blood in the phone booth and then you just know he's dead you know he got stabbed he's dead and then you see the body in the garbage so sorry for Jack, which at that point I was kind of thinking, you know, maybe Jack's involved in this because he's kind of a smarmy character. And then also that moment where when the guy got thrown off the bridge at the um, train station or where the train was, Jack just like randomly shows up and Gregory even questions him on it. He's like, where did you come from? So when that happened, I was like, oh, he's a little bit suspect. I don't know. But then he gets killed and I'm like, well, not him. So Valinsky is a very sinister looking guy. He delivers his lines in a sinister way as well. He just looks that way. But also his introduction to the backstory where he literally steps out of the shadows like a vampire. And that's when he's like, you know, the, the police officers basically said, I think there's some mental stuff going on with you, Gregory, and you should go to a basically a mental asylum. And then that's when Valinsky steps out of the shadows and says, I'll take care of this guy. And then things just get so bad. That's kind of what ushers in the very end of the film where you really find out what's going on. But so sinister from the get-go. The medical theater setup is very creepy, in my opinion. And it's very tense and scary as Gregory ends up getting wheeled out there on the gurney because as an audience member, you're very much aware that he is actually alive. He is conscious. And who doesn't think that it's horrifying to to be in that situation of being awake and aware when you're going to be operated on especially when not only are you going to be operated on but it's an autopsy you know you won't come out of it there's no hope that alone was horrifying and honestly i thought it was very effectively shot with the music with the way the acting was with the camera work the directing it was all perfect for being super horrifying very scary in my opinion not, you know not everyone's going to experience it the same way as me but for me horrifying what a horrifying ending to that film and then especially the very end when it gets finally gets plunged into him I actually was half expecting that someone would step in maybe Jessica and be like no and stop things but no the way it ends he literally gets stabbed in the heart with that scalpel and you know the autopsy is going to actually happen. Even though Jessica yells out, you know he's done. It's tough. And it's well done. Very well done, in my opinion. So it was basically a cult seeking dominance. Probably world dominance in this instance. And like I talked about before, the whole generational thing. Where it's the older generation trying to keep control and disenfranchise the younger generation. And make them sacrifice, them, sacrifice themselves to keep things the way they have it, and if they won't sacrifice themselves, they will sacrifice them for them, if that makes sense. 
Uh, it's a pretty surreal turn in a film that otherwise felt very realistic, which I think is a very important thing to say, because that's a great misdirection in that sense. The whole tone of it, the whole setting of it, feels very real to life. And then you bring in this ending, this theme, like, out of left field at the very end, and it is very surreal. It's not a very realistic thing. So for that reason, you never would have suspected something like that. And that's great for the surprise factor, and I love that ending of it. The scene of the ritual at the club is very weird, but I kind of like it. It kind of reminded me of, even though it was before this film, kind of reminded me of the film Society. Uh, and it also reminded me a little bit of the film All the Colors of the Dark. If you've seen that one, which is also a giallo, you should see that one. It's a good one. So, um, And the last thing I just had to say is that the pacing was rough uh, in the beginning, like I already said, but the delivery at the end is so great that it almost offsets some of that stuff. I mean, if you're going to rewatch the film because you like it, like me, you still will have to re-suffer through some of the stuff in the beginning, which is tough. But uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, I struggled on where I need to put this, but because of the ending and the way they, they had a message in this and it was effective... I'm giving it a four-star rating. I enjoy this Giallo film. This is a good one. It is one of the better ones. So, you know, like I said, there are real mixed reviews on it. I'm on the end of this is very worth it. Quite good, in my opinion. Glad I saw it. And I went in with such a negative mindset. So maybe that was part of it, is not expecting a whole lot, but getting a lot. So anyway, uh, I want to hear what you have to say about this film. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Or just talk about Giallo in general because, you know, I'm nerdy for the subgenre. Uh, but do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button if you can. I really would appreciate that. Uh, just trying to grow the community here and also just that's how you can pay me back. Like, I don't make money doing this. I'm not monetized at all or anything like that. I just want to grow the community and get nerdy with like-minded horror nerds. So let's do that. Uh, also, if you could just hit this, the uh, notification bell as well. And that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos. So yeah, that would be great. But anyway, thanks for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.